paper magic will survive like the heat death of the universe and will... <laughs> oh, it's a smuggler's copter. Would you like to crew this? And then it crashes because they don't understand arithmetic. All your cards belong to me. Two minutes into Mason him in the eyeballs, I switched to pepper spray. He's like, yeah, it's downright refreshing. And went back to the race. Magic is dying. I'm done. <laughs> Selling everything. I might be a hoarder. And yes. I don't have the crayons or glue to explain this to you right now. <laughs> Were you going to die twice? Oil Just... would be worthless before magic cards would. Well, okay, Dr. Man. That's Mr. <laughs> Dr. Professor Jason. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Brainstorm Brewery. I'm joined this week by DJ and Cass. No Jason this week. He is out. So as you might have noticed, we, uh, we've been kind of changing up the, uh, the rotating cast a little bit here, giving everyone we, um, a little bit of break. We, we watched some parenting documentaries, and we decided to do the opposite of what all of them said. Uh, we're really trying to avoid that whole like attachment listener thing. We're trying to, you know, how it's really good when you just ship a kid to seven different foster homes in three years. We're just trying to keep you on the edge, keep keep your brain wired, keep you active and alert in all situations. No, this is wrong. This is the wrong way to look at it. We got to keep expectations low. Don't rely on me being here. I'm not like that. <laughs> I, like. It, it, Orphanages used to be able to just like drop your kid off for like daycare just for like one to two, three years. And like, we're like that, except for a pot. Like, I might be gone next week and then show up three years from now. And I can, I can just leave you with that detachment disorder and then just come pick you up from daycare and just get back on this recording like in 20, 20, That's too deep. Maybe. You're going know. way too deep. You're looking at this the wrong I way. I mean, he's got to flex his psych degree somehow. Yeah. That's, that's, look at it this way sports TV shows. That are panel shows have a rotating host of panelists. It's no never the same four people forever. Uh, around the horn has maybe a dozen panelists that they say. We'll get at that. One. Well, well what are we am... panelists on, Corbin? Brainstorm Brewery, DJ. That's the name of this podcast. We've been doing it for like twelve years. And what is should... this podcast? What? I'm, I'm I'm prompting you to do an introduction for people who have never listened to the show before because you're oh oh well welcome everybody who's never listened to the show this is brainstorm brewery where we have a rotating host of guest panelists uh, who sometimes serve as hosts to talk about the world of magic finance you're doing great I know I am uh I like to claim my spot as the James A caster of this podcast that means I'm the funny one oh no one knows is that a that's, he's a comedian. He's a British comedian. He's so funny. <laughs> you, Corbin, old man. <laughs> That's, I don't know. I'm not saying they're not funny. I don't know who they are. How dare you? How dare you come on to this podcast for your, not monthly, know my British your comedians. monthly visit and waste it <laughs> on not knowing this incredibly important person? Okay. Well, I was um, getting to know another uh, important person. Last week, while DJ and Cass brought you a two person episode of BSB. Jason and I recorded a very special episode uh, that you can find in your feeds. You can find it at youtube.com slash brainstorm brewery. We interviewed Lucas Kuntz, a Democratic senatorial candidate from Missouri, who also happens to be a magic player. And I said this on the show that we did. Um, this is not a politician who plays magic, right? They, they, they've, they've turned on arena. They played back in the day. They got a commander break on. This is a magic player. He has a collection. Um, I think, you know, actually back on, on, on this show, um, it's been a while, but we had um, Travis Nance, sort of the mountain expert, had all these crazy old play tests and all the very rare version of mountain you can find. Well, Lucas has the Wanderlust version of that. Every cool version of the, the old alpha called card Wanderlust, as well as a, a revised sheet that he has hanging on the background of his wall uh, originally stood out when I saw him on MSNBC or CNN or somewhere during the pandemic doing an interview. Um, so if you want to go check that out, um, we mixed, we talked about magic. We kept it pretty chill. We let him uh, talk about um, his campaign and, and sort of what he stands for. Uh, and then we chatted a lot about commander and his all, uh, you know, DJ has something commander decks. He has a uh, 1995 and earlier commander deck whatever you want, an old school command. So you can go check that out. Uh, that's what we were up to while you all were uh, doing your thing. Over here. So 
going back to my previous analogy, what Corbin's really saying is that you get two Christmases this week. It's so nice. It's one Christmas from each divorced half of the cast. See, I... In, like, three or four episodes, I'm going to leave for cigarettes, and I'm never coming back. <laughs> then, like, 20 years, I'm going to show up, because I'm going to have he- heard you guys made it big. I'm going to be like, hey, y'all got any of that Patreon money? You remember you remember me, right? Patreon.com slash BSB, and we'd love to make it big on there, everyone, if you're listening. Hit that like hey. button. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, I I'm, I keep asking YouTube to add, like, a 1 in 2,000 drop rate to make the subscribe button come when you hit it, but they haven't done that yet, so... Good suggestion, though. The thing about most buttons that make things come is, like, they, they work most of the time when you hit it. Like, 1 in 2,000 means that someone's doing something wrong, AJ. <laughs> I I don't want to think about the logistics of it any more than I already I just like to thank the good Lord put my G-spot where he did for a reason. God bless. This is certainly where I saw this conversation going when I put it. <laughs> When I was like, yeah, we'll talk about this really cool, um, high-class, educated, prestigious interview we did. This is where you all take me. Well, that's that's because we got two parts of the podcast. We got the classy and we got the assy. (laughs) But only rarely. What if the YouTube button was on? Corbin, 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 just think of it like a shiny Pokemon, okay? Like, it's... It's like a shiny orgasm. It would be shiny. (laughs) Listeners want rarity. They want serialized. I don't want to think about it anymore. Both of you, stop it. Subscribe to our Patreon. Give me a reason to to come back. Patreon.com. Patreon.com slash BSB. Please um, check it out. Support us. We would appreciate it. In the meantime, we're going to talk about everyone's favorite part of Magic. Magic Arena and Standard. Can we talk about Paper Standard instead? Well, this, let's talk about this. We learned via uh, probably the most important. Now, like you should follow all of us on Twitter, clearly. But the most important person to follow on Twitter and all of Magic is likely Fire Shoes. Uh, we've got him doing spotting at the Pro Tour now. Uh, my boy Fire Shoes is um, all the information you need for competitive Magic, for anything Magic, really. Uh, as he pointed out, It was a stock stay on Arena, which means you can get free gold, essentially. But also, they put up the cards Reckoner Bankbuster and Fable of the Mirror Breaker and an offer you can't refuse. Except, shocker, you can refuse those because you couldn't actually purchase them. Uh, And then they were removed from the store. Now, this is leading to a lot of speculation and it seems fairly well founded that these cards are going to get the axe and some standard bands keeping in mind that standard was recently announced to go to a three-year format instead of two meaning we'd have another year of these cards uh in the format than we would have otherwise so there is uh, that's an interesting um this is a little splinter twin situation well there there is a standard ban announced for monday like we know we're getting a ban on monday yep well, we're getting a ban list announcement. It might be no changes, but we're getting an announcement on Monday. Historically, haven't they... There was a time when they only announced changes when there were changes, right? I think that's what they're doing now. I'm not sure, so I don't want to, like, you know... They, they've they've pulled the divorce parent. They, they, they learned the whole keep them guessing montage kind of thing that I talked about earlier, so were the distressed child the situation? Is there a ban list? Is there a Christmas? You don't know. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. So you see, it works. It keeps us engaged with the product. It keeps us, it keeps our minds wired and uh, inspired. Wired and inspired is how I, <laughs> I like first. that. That's good, I DJ. That. Yeah, yeah I, that's I was good. off the cuff, but it, it came together nicely. That's a, that's a good slogan. You'd be a good slogan man, a good pitch man for the Matrix. Some real, some real Don Draper. <laughs> I gotta start smoking if I'm doing that. Though. That is true. Smoking is objectively cool. Bad for you, but cool key to the uh the whole bit wait i gotta go grab that there reminds me i gotta grab cigarettes <laughs> and then i I'll be back in 20 years bit. yeah and then i but he doesn't want to get up you know what my you know what is gonna last 20 years is this breaking bolt because it's probably not getting reprinted anytime soon breaking bolt time
Breaking bulk time. Break, break, break. Oh, yeah, breaking bulk. There's so much good stuff. It's a pick. Breaking bulk. The end. Segway right on out of there. was more to talk about with Standard. But you know what? I pitched it off. Jetsky Dragons another day. Look, the news is those cards are going to get banned, most likely. Uh, we'll see what happens financially. Um, and Standard will be worth following up on. Remember, we had Meat Hook Massacre get banned. The price dipped some, but it still stayed pretty high. We'll see what happens to Fable, because uh, it turns out that that card's still pretty good everywhere else. Uh, Reckoner Bank Buster, maybe a little less so, uh, if that one were to go as well. That would be Just, really interesting if that card did get banned, right? It was very um, synonymous to a Smuggler's Copter. If, if that card... Bank Buster goes. Bank Buster is like a pure rate card. It like kind of yeah. pushes out aggro strategies in conjunction with the other cards that mid-range decks get to play. It, re it really lends the format to being <laughs> mid-range piles versus mid-range piles, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, and it's it's good, but it is, it's just the same Smuggler's Copter problem that just goes into everything. And right. it's... It, yeah, it just it just smooths everything out. I mean, honestly, Fable does too. If you ask yourself, how can a Rakdos deck be the best deck in a format? Usually the decks are Grixis. In fact, they've been Grixis in standard. Why aren't they Grixis to get all the, the card advantage or whatnot out of blue? And the answer is they can just play a ton of lands uh, and hit all their land drops. And then Fable will dig them through their deck. Uh, and, and Blood Tithe Harvester. Blood Tithe will Harvester. Through their deck is sort of the secret unsung hero. I think that's one of the most egregious yep. cards in the deck. It just, it it slices, it dices, it does everything at like 60%. It's no no king of anything, but it's a jack of all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, some of the lands have abilities attached to them, right? They, I mean, they, it just credibly, a, a black red deck won't run out of gas. And that's where we're at, which is, it's interesting. So Bankbuster does sort of that thing, just slots into everything. And I don't know, standards? What's interesting is that there are some decks that have risen up. Like we've seen some fab some some Rakdos decks with no fable. We've seen some dragons decks come up recently. The five color deck is decent against black red. The format has a lot of the same cards, but the format itself is not necessarily stale because the games play out pretty dynamically. Um, and there's the, lots of different decks with those same cards. <laughs> the problem with the card Fable is if you are on the draw and your opponent plays a Fable and you don't have like a Duress for it on one or Hold Up Negate, you just fall so far behind and it's so hard to come back. So like, I can or see why they'd ban that one. Despair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But even even an Invoke Despair on the draw is yeah, not good Yeah, that only enough. works if you're on the play. Yep. Right. Which is actually why you saw Black Red decks splashing blue at the PT just for Negate because on the draw it lets you have game against them playing a Fable. Because like if you negate their fable, then play yours. You can't lose. Yeah, and um, Corpse Appraiser was the other big um, yeah part there, being able to uh, incidentally exile people's Denik or whatever out of their graveyard. Anyway, that's a lot of standard talk. But the, the reality is standard's actually pretty fun. All of that said, the next pro tour is modern. Uh, and if you are listening to this uh, this on on Thursday on, so maybe patrons, it'll not be another day. But go check out Frank Carson's column on Magic.gg a lot to dig into it's gonna be fun i will make one last note on standard before we move on uh watsy has to they have an intent to push in-store standard play mm -hmm. and i for one greatly look forward to being able to go to a standard local and play with the new cards from the new set on like a tuesday night or something that just sounds great to me that's one of the things i miss the most about paper magic is standard locals yeah it was i would always... hope that the the three-year standard paradigm doesn't mean that standard is just cards from two years ago piles. I mean, I think that, like, them being willing to do one ban a year, because I think they said they're doing only one ban per year now, right? I don't know. Um, they plan to do a ban with every rotation, I think, is, like, the idea. Um, I think the magic design space is open enough that, like, only truly problem children will, will be issues. And... It's one of those things where Shield Red being in standard for two more years kind of sucks because like people will be playing with Shield Red the whole time, but also like means you get to play with your Shield Reds for longer, right? So like if you buy your standard cards, it feels good to get more play out of them. Sure. Yeah. And eventually Shield Red will rotate, and the cards that have been in standard for you know that one year will get their additional two years. What What's interesting is that they they had the time period where they changed extended from whatever extended was the extended being double standard, the so four yeah. years of cards. 
with this idea of we want to give your card somewhere to go longer value but then people hated it because it was like the most oppressive standard decks of the past two years now dominated the next format um that extended and, you know, also maybe... had the... go ahead that extended also had the issue of being full of cards that watsi printed to like try and save the company that's right, what like, I was gonna say. It, there was a lot going on then that is not necessarily an indictment of the idea, right? Like shards of a lot. Like after Lorwyn and after the recession, Watsi was just like, "Oh, we need to like we're, we cannot turn the lights on sometimes." Fetch lands and lightning bolt go. Like that extended format was full of some of the most egregious yes. reprints and designs. Like Zendikar as a whole was full of super busted stuff because they just like had to print exciting cards. And it saved magic, but it meant the four-year extended was very bad. Yeah, I think that was... I'm pretty sure fairies was a thing, if I remember. It was fairies and Volokut Primeval Titan. That was that yeah. extended format. There were Jace decks, too, and I remember playing Green-White Summoning Trap. Where That's what Primeval I was going to say. Chris Van Meter put me on Green-White Summoning Trap back then. That ruled. And I PTQ'd with that deck. That was fun. Primeval Titan, eight Hideaway Lands, four Ionas, and four Emrakuls. Let's go. That, uh, oh yeah. I, I won on like a mold of three yep. with that deck. I got my like Cloud Thresher against my opponent's Bitter Blossom or whatever off yep. of a, uh, uh, whatever. It was an amazing deck. Sometimes it just anyway, though, it didn't work as a format. But. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see this time around. Uh, look, I what I like is that I'm seeing a bunch of commander content creators saying things like, oh, I really feel like I missed the golden age of GPs. And, and standard magic on Twitter, like, it really does feel like, yeah, that's exactly right. Like, I feel like maybe something's coming down the line here. They announce if they do a good job of getting buy-in from the content creator community on whatever standard in-store initiatives they're going to do, that would be massive. It'd be I mean, really the way to good do that. for, like, magic card price. Like... It would really be good for vendors, right? To be able to to move standard cards to get people opening current packs. Great for LGSs. I'm cautiously optimistic. I think the way they get content creators to buy in is like, you don't need content creators per se to, to do standard mm -hmm. content. You need pros to make standard content, become content creators. And you do that by giving them incentives to play standard, right? Like give us a standard PT and there will be all kinds of pro boundary players streaming standard which is great for it yeah and it, i mean we just we just we just had a standard pt and it went well yep. i think um the format was pretty good i mean there was a, this standard format even if we get bans it's important to understand that this standard format is not like bad standard formats of the past um right. if i think it's to like aetherworks marvel into team or energy type bans those decks were just you just do you just aim to do with Marvel, you were just trying to speed run your Marvel. And with the other thing, you were just trying to go like listener L or whatever the, the, the two drop into Rogue Refiner into uh what, Bristling Hydra. Whatever. Bristling Hydra. Yeah, into Bristling Hydra yeah. on four. Yeah, like and then you just you just did that every game, right? One now the... your cards like Blood Tithe Hyvester and Invoke and Fable, like all of these cards while very good and bank bank reckon or bank buster being a card advantage engine or a, a, an aggro thing if you want to play it that way like there's just a lot of different ways the games play out so even if the format is sort of defined by a handful of cards the games play out in a much more dynamic and interesting way but one of that's if you the, like mid-range slot fests <laughs> one of the big things people don't realize about fire design is every card having a cantrip attached and so many cards being modal and cards generally being more powerful means that games are more dynamic like the worst thing in magic is when you flood out and can't do anything and you feel like you're powerless and in the fire design era cards just do more they draw more cards which can lend itself to a mid-range slugfest but i think management of the ban list and conscious effort of like, watsi has got to have known that the standard three-year thing has been coming for a while, right? Like, they don't just make this decision haphazardly, I feel like. You or maybe they do. So. You I mean, would... one would hope. I, I don't we're think being... that all the cards that it currently exists in standard were designed with this in mind. Right. But I also don't think that zero of them were, I guess, is probably my... Right. I have a feeling 
there will be growing pains, but over the next few years, we will we will find a groove. Like we said, we're cautiously optimistic. Yeah. Maybe you know, maybe someone will break standard, just like we're about to break some bulk. Break your bulk time. Break your bulk time. Break. 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 Oh yeah, breaking bulk. There's so much good stuff. It's a pick. Breaking bulk. The end. <laughs> there you go. I was gonna say that was that was pretty good. I was gonna go with. I'm cautiously optimistic that I'm going to emerge as the champion of Breaking Bulk again because you all. I was better. Going Why'd you do this? this? You're not gonna guess this card. This is a blue common from Morning Tide. Is it the four mana draw card for each creature that shares a type? Nope. Damn. Is it, wait, did you say it's it's just blue common for Morning Tide? Yep. Uh, Moth Dust Changeling. I... Nope. Is Marrow, it the... Com Marrow Commerce is lore one, I think. Also is an the... uncommon. Is it the Rogue Prowl spell that draws... Or that, like, no, that's ponders? uncommon. Thieves, uncommon. Thieves whatever is uncommon. Okay. Um, Thieves Fortune. Uh... Blue common from Morning Tide. Not a trick question. These sets are like a black hole in my brain. I'm well, it's Corbin, so it has to be a merfolk. Broke. I'm emerging as a champion. Wait, give me a few seconds. As we speak, I can feel myself emerging as a winner. I give up. The wizard. Oh, is it? Uh, it's a Merfolk wizard. Is it the? Is it the? Whenever you no, that's. I think that's Shadowmoor. Is it the one like whenever you play a blue spell, you untap it? I think that cycles Shadowmoor. Is it a wizard instant? No. Nope. All right, I'll I'll F six. I will I will be yeah. an, I will accept my annoyance when you say it, and I know it. I yield my time. Yep. Stony Brook Banneret. Oh sure. Yeah, sure. Cost questions? reducer. I good. appreciate the it's a wizard as the misdirection. I did think you'd like that. I thought it was going to be like Sage's Will or something, whatever like the, the instant counter spell is. To, to yeah. be fair though, DJ, like it also discounts your wizard spells. It does. Uh, I do play this in my tribal wizards a zombie deck. I uh, play the uh, yeah. goblin, the, whatever the goblin one that's actually rogues. It's like a, a black yeah. one, so it's for goblins and rogues, and I play that uh -huh. in Sig River Cutthroat. I really hope they go back to... I have no idea what happened like in the story with that set, block, whatever, but um, I really enjoyed the uh, some of the mechanics. I, I don't know if they could design them today. I know that it's they sort can. of famous... Well, I know that it sort of famously was like too complicated and they don't do tribal as a mechanic. So like, I'm not but, sure... But they can what have creature like. type themes be the theme of Lorwyn without it being tribal. Yeah, I'm just doesn't. I'm just trying to figure out like how it doesn't just look like Exelon or whatever. But anyway, I do hope they go back to it. I really that was around the time I got into it. Not exactly, but I always liked the sort of aesthetic from Shadowmoor, especially. I I found a new deep love and understanding of the Shadowmoor aesthetic. Uh, I think last year Spice Eight Rack had a video about juxtaposition of I guess vibes in the plane of Lorwyn. Uh, it's like a two and a half hour video essay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you're into that kind of thing, like I really think that it, it it delves into what makes Lorwyn awesome. And that's like not a sponsor plug. That's just a plug. Yeah. Some content I, th I enjoyed. Uh, I know Rosewater has talked before that one of the barriers to get people into Lorwyn was that there was no human representation as weird as that sounds. There's like 45 minutes in that video essay about that. I figured, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, oh, it's a masterpiece. Weird. All right, I have a conspiracy. Take the crown. So that is conspiracy sequel. Uh, what? What do you mean, God? No, I'm just not gonna know. There's nothing wrong with it. Go this on. This is a good set for breaking bulk. I picked it because I thought it'd be a softball of sorts. The card next to it was like this esoteric nonsense card. And I was like, I'll go with the easy one. Uh, this is a red uncommon from Conspiracy. Take the crown with no reprints. Is it the uh, pay a Red make the pay three life make a red or something. That is from original conspiracy. Got me. Treasonous ogre. Yeah, that card's sweet. It's very. Uh, I don't know what's in that at all. Is it a you, monarch card? 
No, it's the other keyword in that set. What's the other keyword in that set? Will of the Council? No. Dethrone. No, Dethrone was Conspiracy 1. This is this is a commander mechanic they have reused many a time, and it is a regular draft effect they've used many a, many a time, and it is just, it recists together with the peanut butter and the chocolate. It's just two very common things you see on magic cards mushed together. Is it goad? It is the goad version. This is terrible. Of act of treason. Oh yeah, this card's sweet too. It is. Yeah. It is besmirch two and a red, two red and one colorless until end of turn. Gain control of target creature. It gains haste. Untap and goad that creature. So you steal their thing, smack somebody with it, give it back, and then they smack somebody with it. Uh, this is just dodged reprints, and it's a dollar. It's just, and it's not the kind of, well, it's also not the kind of card you pick for bulk, right? If you don't have a scanner, and if you don't have any sort of way to just verify bulk picks, you you go past this because every act of treason effect previously has just kind of always been bulk, except for really weird ones, and this is one of those weird ones because it has a niche. I feel like people underestimated Goad and still kind of do. It's a legit... It does so much, yeah. It speeds also, games along. Yeah, it does. That's one of the the really underrated parts of it. Um, right. yeah, for sure. All right, Cast go ahead. I have three potential breaking bulks. I'm gonna go with the one that I think will be the hardest to get, and if y'all get it really easy, I'll do another one. All right. Um, this is a white nemesis common. Oh, not easy. Tireless White tracker. Nemesis Common. Uh, Tireless fanatical de- No, no, no. Fanatical Devotion. DJ gets it in one. Uh, I'm guessing I'm that's a Roku card. No, I actually uh, knew this one before because I uh, I played it in Archangel Avacyn because it's a white sack outlet that lets you trigger other regeneration sure. stuff. Uh, it's a white and two colorless for an enchantment. It's sack a creature, regen a creature. Yep. Uh, card's like 75 cents to a dollar. Uh, I was, I was just getting that. I was picking bulk recently, and I saw that card, and I'm like, that's a really unique effect. And I looked it up, and I was like, oh, yep, it's worth something. Um, My other one is a uh, Betrayers of Kamigawa Uncommon Artifact. Shuko? Shuko. Card's like two bucks now. I picked Seth Illusionist a few weeks ago, uh, and Shuko is a part of that same deck, and probably the same reason that card's going up. That deck is very good. It's also a weird card to, to reprint. Yeah, just because of how that mechanic works, it's really hard to put it in a commander deck. I think because then you just end up with weird effects that are just infinite. Like putting that card in a commander deck and a commander preconstructed deck limits a lot of other cards you can put in a commander preconstructed deck. I think. Yeah, because it goes infinite with well plenty of things. It also has the weird thing of being like a named weapon for a real world weapon. Is that like an Amazon search engine? Like, we don't want kids to, f- like... It's, it's just like, it's a real-world thing. I don't know. I, I, It's hard to put into, like, a standard set again or something, right? Like, it is tied to it is, it's like a Japanese weapon. It is intrinsically Kamigawa-themed, you are correct. Right, right. That's what I'm saying. I, I just wasn't sure if it was, a th- uh, like, a throat slitter thing. No, although that card probably is a disaster for SEO. Yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> there's an old story from about ten years ago where I was buying with, like, a bunch of cards to a vendor and throat slitter was two or three dollars at the time and they were only paying a quarter on it and i asked why and they famously said uh parents don't let their kids buy cards named throat slitter yeah so apparently i was slightly wrong ashuko isn't necessarily a weapon they are uh climbing claws is how they're referred to so they dig into like the ice or whatever that you're climbing that's still cool that is really cool (laughs) i didn't know that i'm I'm going to go back, though, to to this for our next topic here. DJ mentioned things that are difficult to reprint, hard to put in a commander deck. One of the things we've said on this podcast for a long time is that double face cards are more difficult to reprint. Well, Wizard said, uh, hold my beer, and went and printed a commander precon that was unlike the other secret layers. This one wasn't made to, like, uh, printed... To demand, this was a certain number were printed. They sold them. Now they're sold out. All of them have shipped. I already got mine. The deck itself is sort of a train wreck, is uh, <laughs> what people say. But we talked about this one maybe being a good buy, and now there are no more of them available. 
uh, directly from Wizards, etc. So I just uh, did. Did either of you go in on this? What are your thoughts? I didn't personally. Uh, some stores I've worked with did. I think this deck intrinsically has the problem of it not being a deck. It's just a pile of cards people are going to buy and split up like any other secret yeah. layer. Yes. Which means the misses are just going to be worth actual zero and the hits are going to be devalued pretty heavily because how many people saw this as an opportunity to buy 30 of them and crack them and list them on TCG? The yep. limit was five for what it's worth. I'm sure there are plenty of ways that you were able to skirt that somehow, but uh, I mm. bought five and my my current plan for them is to just out them to people who forgot that they could buy them and missed the mark. Uh, that is a common thing with secret layers where somebody is a big fan of X product or X artist or whatever kind of uh, fanfare that secret layer is based off of. They put out their Google calendar. Life gets in the way. Oh, that, that was like three weeks ago. Uh, it was what thirty dollars when it came out. It's fifty now. Whatever, I'll just buy it. I want it. So right. uh, that that is a thing. I do understand that this one is not as much of a a cohesive deck, but I think that five colors stuff is still can still just be enough of a theme that people want to buy it and not deal with it. Yeah. Uh, like man, five color mana bases are hard to build. I know this one doesn't have the best mana base, but at least comes with a mana base that you can upgrade. It is just it comes a pile with a chromatic of lantern. Yeah. You, you can sleeve it up, and then you can jam a game or two and then start tinkering with it and it'll be fine you can put what you can buy this and then just put whatever you want in it and i think that's that's fine you can be like oh i've got this this page of gods in my bind uh what there's this page of legendary creatures oh there's a garth one eye and a other thing that says legend on it six times oh it's a legendary theme deck now there's so many yeah. directions you can go with this and i think it's very malleable and it was a great spot to put a lot of these cards that needed double-faced reprints, where previously the only spot we get double-faced reprints is from the Vault Transform, and, I mean, they don't do double-faced reprints in standard sets now because they use that design space so much more wildly. Like, they, they don't reprint uh, Jace Rin's Prodigy, they make Fable the Mirror Breaker. They, they don't right. do... They don't yep. just, oh, we need Bloodline Keeper in a standard pro No, they just find the next cool thing because somebody has a cool design space for a flip card. And if you bought this for $150, I think there are a few different ways that you can out it if you're looking to just like grind it into something else or upgrade your collection. And I also don't think it's a terrible buy just in terms of buy it and add $200, $250 worth of stuff to your binder or collection. It does have big trade binder deck vibes. Well, it, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a pile. I, I got two of them. I opened one, um, put the other one up, whatever. I, you know, it goes in the closet of Magic Sealed product. Uh, it's tough for me because I tend to want to go all the way with my decks. And I've never built a five-color deck piece. That would mean I'd really want to build a five-color mana base with all my fetches and all the duel, like, and just spend way too much money on a mana base for it. This is a truly budget five color, you know, common tap land that's two colors. There's a lot of the, the two-sided cards. I've decided to keep it mostly casual. Uh, DJ mentioned gods. That's what I'm doing with mine. I'm turning it into, I guess, a gods deck because you can play the, the prismatic bridge. Now, the five cards that come with the alt art are pretty cool. Um but yeah, it's a, I guess I'm going to try to keep it as a mostly casual-ish deck as I opposed also think to, to my that, others. So uh, cuteness is an underrated metric by which you can value a Magic card's price. Oh, yeah. If you, if you look at the... Uh, so here's, here's an MTG Stocks game, unofficial one. An unofficial okay. MTG Stocks game. It's like the Rogue game, the one that wears glasses and a, a hoodie in the corner. It's kind of cool. Uh, this This one's like not technically sponsored we'll do a sponsored bit later by them but this yeah uh so what do you think is the most expensive original secret layer out of the original secret layers they did and i kind of spoiled the answer already because i led into this bit the it was like the original three were dredge uh bitter blossom and goblins i don't know but i know the cats one was among them the cats one was a little bit oh, later wasn't OMG it kitties was within the first like sure the first barrage of secret layers yeah. if you want to, the first salvo that one's like 150 uh, bucks, right? For a sealed it's, copy? It's over 200. I'm sure. But it is very, very expensive. It's just OMG kitties. It's got some cute regal caracal tokens. It's got some adorable uh, Leonin war leader token. It's just... It's got a good Miri. It's got 
And it's just cute. And this secret lair just has cute things, and that's fine, and they can be worth a lot of money. Ben looked at him, my seven-year-old looked at him and said, uh, it's the chibi variants. Because that's if you, if you I don't play know how Mar to feel that he knows that word. If you play Marvel's, it's because he uh, he plays Marvel Snap on my phone, where they have the chibi art variants. Uh, so, um, but yeah, the point is, it was recognizable to a seven-year-old as cute. You're right. That does it. Right. Does uh, it does mean something? I, I I kind of have said this jokingly in the past about Pokemon cards, but the more cool Pokemon are on a card, the more valuable it is. Like uh. There's a card, and obviously the card is like has some scarcity issues. It's called Lucky Stadium, but it's like the last Black Star promo from Watsi era. And like, uh -huh. there's no reason it should be as expensive as it is. It's just it should be expensive given how scarce it is. But it's got a, a Pikachu riding a Charizard, and like that's just two cool things together, right? That card's worth it's like five hundred bucks. People that resonate with friend shaped <laughs> things. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next up. I like this segment. Eric. This is uh, Mark Rosewater. Had some advice recently for Magic players. Um, and it was this. Quote, don't get rid of your cards. There is nothing wrong with taking a break, but the majority of players later return, and their greatest regret is having gotten rid of their cards. What, uh, how, does that, how does that statement hit you all? It makes a lot good, of sense to me. I'm not the best person to ask that question. Well, here's what here's what I was thinking about. Because at first I'm like, yeah, I know what we're all going to say. I I wrote an article and I said, don't sell your merfolk. And where my advice is, don't sell the thing in magic that means the most to you because you'll regret it later. It's I'm, you don't need to keep every card, um, but keep whatever is sentimental to you. Sort of more importantly, the monetary value. Um, so. So that's where I listen. That's where I come in. I get to know what we're going to say there, but we only hear from the people who come back. How many people get rid of their cards and are super happy about it, and we never hear from them? Well, so it's really easy to not sell your cards and then later decide to sell them and then sell them. It's really hard to sell your cards and then unsell them. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that's a good argument. <laughs> Like, I think if you're going to get out of Magic, just give it some time, take a break, and if that break feels right for you, sell them. Who cares? But, like, if you're kind of just one of those people who likes to jump from thing to thing or, like, you've become disillusioned with the hobby, give it a couple months. You know, do something else. If that sparks more joy, sell your Magic cards and buy paints. You know, go 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 do go do landscapes. I was, uh, the advice I was given when I got my tattoo was make it your phone screen for two months, and if you still don't hate it, then put it on your body. And I think that's kind of a similar vibe. <laughs> that's um advice the advice my tattoo artist gave me was it put it on your body it's cool as hell if it makes you happy it makes you happy so very different vibes sure uh but i i digress <laughs> i have had a lot of people sell their collections to me and every now and again when we are going through the process we will hit one card where they, they will have a sentimental story or they will have a lot of memories associated with that card. And I'll usually just pass it back to them and say, this sounds like it's worth more to you than the $3 it'll end up being in the transaction. And they, they say, you know what, you're right. And then they'll they'll put it away or they'll sleeve it, keep it. Uh, and I think that there are... You you can spend a small amount of time descending, deciding what those cards are to you. And, I mean, Corbin summarized it pretty well. Uh, I've also heard sell your cards don't sell your decks echoed on reddit kind of the same thing and i think it is also worth when you decide to sell your collection figuring out the best way that you want to do that whether it's if you want to spend a lot of time parsing it out and creating a tracker list and then giving that to somebody and maximizing your value or if you just want to get get out of the game and get it all done with while still minimizing your losses there, there are a lot of ways you can go into that uh and we've done plenty of videos and tutorials on those uh but it, it is worth spending that that amount of introspection i guess to figure out what feels right to you well that's what i was going to say is you're, you're right and we've gotten into all the details before but I mean, even people i've known and like known well enough to give this advice to have done the thing where they just something happens oh i gotta get out of magic Buy all my cards. Buy all my cards. I need to do it in the next 
I got to do it tonight. I got to do it tonight. Well, okay. You can make a lot more money if we do about this a different way. Uh, you know, like this is the same advice I give people on the podcast. Like you shouldn't, this is not how you want to do this, but that's just how some people do it. And some people do it by choice and some people don't do it by choice. And if you want to just get rid of your stuff in the fastest, most painless way possible and get the money that you'll get from that, you absolutely can. But what you don't want is to be put into that situation uh, against your will, right? So like DJ said, if you keep, you know, if you do a good job of, of just then taking some time, making a plan, you can pay off in the end. Even if you end up just calling DJ and so on. What does yeah. that mean? I'm don't, saying don't that, that that's... Well, well, I'm not in a bad the last way. Resort. No, 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 I don't like that. Not in a bad way. Yes, yeah, A lot a of people... Way. A lot of people have wound up selling cards to DJ after a bad night in a Waffle House. It's just how life goes sometimes. <laughs> I don't like any of this. It Listen, would have been not... better, DJ, if I said, and then I guess you could sell your cards to DJ, actually. <laughs> when the time comes and you've made peace with your collection, you're ready to send it off to the old farm upstate. Make that upstate, upstate New York. Send yeah. it to DJ. <laughs> card Garden MTG. There's a better Actually, way to sell your cards. And it's Card Garden. All right, finally, before we get to pick of the week, I want to talk about a deck that I think maybe Cass might have seen. DJ has not. This is some tip of the iceberg. Uh, be glad that you subscribed to us on Patreon to get the episode early type stuff. Have you all seen Boros Convoke? Oh, you mean Hogak 2.0? A Hogak 2.0. A Splinter Twin situation. It's true. <laughs> um, well, it's a deck that plays a lot of one drops. If you remember back in Standard, the old... Oh, Cass, what was that card? The the, the thing that made the goblins back then. Koldotha Rebirth? Yes, Koldotha Rebirth. But also rebirth away your ornithopter or whatever else. Well, it's back. Lethal demolition. Uh, except now you're convoking all of these tokens you're making into Knight Errant of Eos or Venerated Loxodon in Pioneer. Uh, it won the modern challenge or the Pioneer challenge on Magic Online, and now people are talking about it being uh, the next wildly broken deck you need to be prepared for. So. My first thought on this deck is if it's good and if it's too good, it stops being too good very quickly. Like how many electricries do people have to start playing before this deck becomes stone unplayable? Yeah. This deck <laughs> this deck is not like a Hogak where the payoff is right. going wide or tall. This deck kind of strictly goes wide. Um and it is powerful. Look, if we're gonna talk financially, this deck, I'm gonna go through the cards here in the main. This deck's not worth a lot of money. <laughs> um Ornithopter, Giant Killer, that's a rare. Draven Inspector, Gleeful Demolition, Voldalian Epicure, it's a common if you forget what that is. Clarion Spirit, Resolute Reinforcements, Forbidden Friendship, Reckless Bushwhacker. None of those are rare except for the You just killer. said like 30 words that when I open my phone and autocomplete a sentence, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it just turns into nonsense. You just said a bunch yep. of nonsense words. Uh huh. The, the These are not magic cards you are used to seeing in tournament decks. Forbidden I've fruit seen... scales, less than five, near. <laughs> These Night, cards are all. Night Aaron of, uh, of totally Eos and Varied Locks. Corbin just had a stroke and we're all okay with it. That's what I'm saying. The, like, the part of this deck that actually scares me is the plan A is pretty powerful and robust. And then if they sweep your board, you can just go Ornithopter. Lethal Demolition, Reckless Bushwhacker, 6U, or 8U. Yeah. And like that, that's the part that actually makes me think the deck has staying power, is the card Reckless Bushwhacker. I agree. Reckless Bushwhacker. Yeah, was speaking of how best. Zendikar was a nuts block, like. Well, this is, well, the, re this is the reprint one. With this Surge. is the new one. Yeah. Oh, it's Still, a. The Battle for Zendikar one. Yeah, okay. Or Oath of the Gay Watch, whichever set it was in, but. Uh, oh, okay. Surge. It has Surge, DJ. Ah, oh, yes. The two headed giant mechanic of. Of yes. everyone's memories. For, of, yeah, for, for me, a deck like this, the litmus test for if it's actually like powerful enough to hang in a high power format is if it could play Burning Tree Emissary, but it chooses not to. Like, 
Burning Tree Misery makes a lot of sense for your Convoke deck, but, like, it's probably just not good enough, and, like, that means the deck probably is doing something inherently very powerful. <laughs> is that legal in Pioneer? It is. Uh, Mono Green Devotion also chooses not to play it, which is kind of a sign that that deck is a little bit... <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, when your Mono Green deck doesn't play Burning Tree Emissary... I think yeah, it's like really cool that this red-white uh, Convoke deck exists. Is it... Yeah. Overly good. Wait, I wait, don't wait, know. wait, 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 Cass, but... do you have Larry the Cable Guy bits for this? If your Mono Green deck isn't playing Burn and Tree Emissary, you might be a. That's know. a Bill Ingfall, or is that Jeff Fox? Is Jeff Jeff Foxworthy? Whatever. You might be a redneck. Yeah. If your red white <laughs> Convoke deck doesn't play Burning Tree Emissary, you might be a Hogak. <laughs> there we go. The pieces are there. Sound bite. Yeah. We teamwork that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of teamwork, we have partnered with Coalesce Apparel and Design, and that is where you should be going right now as soon as it's safe for you to pull over anyway. You can see the, the Coalesce shirt DJ's got on. Use the gift code Brainstorm Brewery, get 10% off. You can use that not just for our apparel, the shirt that DJ continues the model there. Uh, that was that was a, spin. That was a full-on spin, yeah. Uh, but there's also all your other favorite magic content creators that you can support. Uh, remember, use that gift code Brainstorm Brewery to get a discount. We really appreciate all the great work they do over there. We're happy to be partnered up the and sponsored discount by them. Scales infinitely. I cannot stress that enough. If you spend six thousand dollars, you'll save six hundred dollars. Pick of the week. Pick of the week. Pick of the week. Time for the pick of the week. All right, I'll start off pick of the week here. Going back to that red-white deck, this is in the sideboard of that deck, uh, but it's also uh, been creeping up in standard. The price is rising. Uh, I, I don't know. This is one of those short-term picks. This is a standard pick, but Invasion of Gobacon. Um, do I know if that's the right way to say it? No. What is a Gobacon? Do I know what this card does? Only vaguely, because I have to turn my head sideways. Uh, however, you get to look at someone's hand, make their spells cost two more to cast, uh, but then it's very easy to transform into a um, enchantment that gives your creature hexproof and destructible by sacrificing it, and a near set puts a counter on each creature that attacks this turn. So it's super powerful and wide aggressive decks. That's why it's in the sideboard of that Boros deck. It's about four dollars right now. It came out of the gates at about two. It's climbed up to about four. And if you're just, just one of those sort of PSA, if you are someone who thinks you might be interested in some of these standard initiatives we've been talking about, go ahead and pick this card up because it's going to be in standard for another two and a half years. Did, did it come out of the guild gates pretty hot? Yeah. No, no. Less of that, more pick of the week. Thank you. Please. Thank you. <laughs> I'm warming up to this soundboard. I feel heard. Unreal. I. My pick of the week is a one of the most popular cards in Commander in the color black, but it is a special version of it. Grey Merchant of Asphodel is very, very well-known card, reprinted a million times, and yet it still lingers on 50 cents. But we are talking about the Time Spiral remastered Old Border one, which is retail uh, around 3 to $4. Uh, but if you look at the MTG stocks graph, you will see it has crept up to around six in the past few weeks. So that has already doubled. And then if you click one of the links on MTG stocks and go to the TCG player page for that card, and you click the checkbox that filters for direct, you will see if you're somehow doing that right this second while I'm recording, uh, you will see that the direct premium is close to $20. So people have been paying double digit numbers for this card. And that has been spiking the market price because some people will pay $3 for the non-direct one, and then some psychopaths will pay a lot more for the direct one. Which means, if you're following along, that people will still pay $10 for the one once it hits the non-direct markets and the card markets and the Ebays and the cool stuffs and the Star Cities. Uh, I don't think that they are going to reprint Grey Merchant into an old border frame anytime soon. They, they seem to have blown their old border load a little while ago on plenty of other things that are related to Theros. Like, they've done old border recently, yes, with Brothers War, but, like, mm -hmm. they've been narrowing it down and figuring out specific categories of cards to do old border. Of like, oh, we're doing all 
artifacts. And next time we'll do all, uh, I don't know, squirrels or whatever. But, like, Theros, they already did. So I, I think you're safe on the old border version of Grey Merchant. Foils are, like, a million dollars, and they're very, very rare. If you need one or are looking for one, now is probably not the worst time to buy one. Uh, but if you're looking for something you can buy 10 or 15 of and put in a closet somewhere, I don't think the old border non-foil Grey Merchants are a bad place to look. Fair enough. All right, Cass, uh, you get the honors of the last pick of the week. What are you looking at? I am looking at General Kudro of Dranith, uh, Black White Human Lord. In March of the Machine Aftermath, there's an uncommon that's sneakily showing up in Modern a little bit, and it is called uh, Copper Coat Vanguard. It's a one and a white, two, two. Each uh -huh. other human creature you control has Ward one and gets plus one, plus zero. Uh, kind of another Lord and kind of a protection spell for Modern humans. That's the key one, I imagine. Yeah. That's, that's uh, it means your creatures are less likely to get a uh, shot by Renin Six. Right. We we had or Fury. Fury's a big one too. We all we had um we had Changeling Outcast thing is what it's called, but that card didn't give your creatures any power. So yeah. uh, the combination of this card plus, you know, General Kudro being pretty strong and the human base being pretty strong as it is leads me to believe that deck could maybe make a comeback. It's also a fan favorite, and it's not like we're not getting more humans every set, you know? yeah yeah that deck is definitely if and fury's the card holding it down more than anything it was yeah the run in six decks and then Fury just kind of obliterated a deck that can't play it instant like the reason like sort of merfolk or spirits or other decks can kind of exist is their ability to one have one drops that don't get hit uh by those cards or can play it instant speed um so yeah for humans and if, if there was any card that they can put in their deck that's going to become a clean answer to Fury is is really close because we've gotten powerful humans. That deck is not that far away from from I think making waves again in modern. So here's the follow up question to that: If humans and other creature type focus strategies have the potential to fight through the hate and make a comeback, Aether Vial is like the cheapest it's ever been as a magic card. Yeah. Yeah. You can get play sets of Aether Vial for like 25, 30 bucks. If that. I don't know how to feel about that. Is that the time to stonks your Aether Vials, or is this card just power crept to the point where it's not no longer necessary? Aether Vial kind of has the, I'm going to call it the doubling season problem, where like every store has too many copies of Aether Vial in stock that like has good stock because there's just like 15 printings of it, right? So like. You buy four Dark Show copies, but you still have four Modern Masters, four Iconic Masters, four The List. Double Masters 2022 from The Vault. Masterpieces. Yeah, there's right. a bunch. The alternate art from Double Masters. Like, there's just so many versions of Aether Vial. Also, uh, to answer your question, DJ, yeah, I think it's been power crap. Yeah. Like, okay. I, mm, I think the card's very strong. I think it's not a power level issue. It's a the answers are so good issue. You, you, yeah, you. I mean, this is Merfolk, for instance. This is my experience with Ether Vials. You always ex you board it out against Jund historically, right? You sure? Uh, well, that's always been a product of you want to board it out. So in current modern, if Fury is your problem or whatever, Ether Vials not necessarily helpful because the problem is you just run out of creatures, but also. A lot of the good creatures cost one or two mana, right? Where you're not really taking your vial up to three or four very often. So we're reaching well, a point where the curve is just like you're playing ones and twos and maybe a three and not your curve tapping out a four, where vial saving you a lot of money by playing all your three drops. Also, the reason you board out vial against Jund is not because of that. It's because they play Coligan's Command. And it's just like a free no, roll. This was true before Colagon's command too, though. You just always sure. it out against the because also, they're gonna like, kill all, you're gonna beat you by killing all your creatures. So you just need to eliminate dead draws. When you think about Aether Vial as a ritual, it's pretty hard to deny that its power level is still there. Right? Like it's one yeah. mana card that produces six to ten, ten mana throughout the course of a game. And even if you're only putting in twos every turn, if those twos are impactful, that works. I really do think Fury is the problem holding this card back. I think Fury is just like a, a a really huge design mistake that that sort of hamstrings the modern format in a way that's unfortunate. But it is weird. Cards that... like 
I, I was just gonna say it's weird that they made that as the the card of the cycle after punishing fire nightmares. Right. Well, yeah, it's also just sort of interesting in a historical sense that the red one that interacts with creatures is the broken one in terms of its effect on the format. Right. Like, I mean, red's the best color the in magic one, now. Yeah, like blue one or endurance are, are much more powerful. I mean, Ren and Six basically was the final nail in the coffin for X one creatures and. It, Cause them to shift their paradigm. Yeah. Uh, I think probably Gilded Goose was probably around the time they did this. But the the new baseline for Mana Dorks appears to be two toughness. Like it appears to be a one two. Do you um, all remember the? And obviously it's about Deathrite Shaman, which is a totally egregious card. But there was a rant on coverage from I, I believe Cedric about how <laughs> Deathrite Shaman has two toughness, and how it can block Goblin Lackey, and how insane that is. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think about that rant a lot. Uh that's just the standard now is one twos yeah yeah so i mean i think that's a big uh, that's a big but the furnace fury does so much so yeah in order for the, the decks to get around it the ward ability is a is a really good way um for a deck to interact with it so yeah i think you're long long story short i guess i think you're you're on something with that uh line of thought if there's a card that is filling that role in human as a reminder, all of our picks come courtesy of MTG Stocks, courteous sponsor of this podcast. And with their analytics available on the premium side, it's the best magic finance tool out there. And also, Jason has started helming the uh, content uh, uh, leadership role over there. And I think that there are now going to be regular articles that you can consume on mtgstocks.com. So make sure to go check out our sponsor there. Everybody, thank you for listening to Brainstorm Brewery. Thank you for listening uh, wherever you listen. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our Patreon, patreon.com slash BSB. Thank you wherever you are for spending some time with us. Get that we'll one in 2,000 drop rate. Uh, we have several videos. You can try that out on on YouTube. You can go back and, on all of our videos and go back through the archives because, uh, I mean, you can't like the same video more than once because that's just oh, like... Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, if you unlike just... it, you can like it again. If you really hammer that button, you might get there. No, 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 no. It's, if, it's you treat it like an, if you treat it like a game of cookie clicker. That's exactly what I treat it like, Corbin.